Welcome to the Friday Five for March 17th, 2023. My name is Andrew Ayers. I'm an estate planning and business law attorney with offices in Edina, Minnesota and New York City. It's St. Patrick's Day, things have gotten pretty cold out here in Minnesota, but hopefully spring is right around the corner. So we're going to look at five questions that came up this week, five quick questions, and maybe you've had these questions in the past too. We'll give you some quick answers and get you on your way to your weekend. Question number one this week, where should I base my estate plan? So this actually came up in two different consultations this week. In one case, the clients are living in one city and are planning on relocating for work for a few months, but then will be coming back to the city where they actually own their apartment. And in the second situation, we actually had a married couple who owned one property in one state and one property in the other, and they were wondering which state should they base their estate plans in. So what we really want to look at, especially in the first situation, is where are we going to be permanently based? So if we know we live in one place and we're just moving somewhere for work for like a short three or four months, then chances are the best place for you to do your estate plan would be where that home is where you're going to come back to. Because otherwise, if you do your estate plan in that state you're in for three or four months and then you move back, you may have to change your estate plan. It may not be the best case scenario for you. But in the other situation, there's a little bit more interest to it. And that is if we own homes in both states and we go back and forth between the two states, what's the best option? And in this situation, we're going to look at, first of all, what's your primary residence, but also what does the probate court look like in both states? So in this couple situation, one state has a nice streamlined informal probate process. The other one has a probate court that's just a nightmare to deal with. So in that case, we're looking at probably going with state number one, the one that has the easier probate uh, court to deal with so that when something happens and we have to probate the will and work with the estate plan, it'll be an easier process for the family members as opposed to the night nightmare probate court in state number two. Question number two this week, what do I do if I have kids who are both over the age of 18 and under the age of 18? So in this case, what we're looking at is obviously a family has three kids. Two of them are over the age of 18. One of them's a few years younger. And the question is, what do we have to do about kids that, who are technically adults and kids who aren't? So when we're looking at the younger child, who in this case was 13, we want to make sure that your will has a guardianship provision and a trustee to manage money for that 13-year-old until they reach the age of 18. Now the question the client had is, child number two is 18, child number three is actually 23. Do we need to establish guardianship for child number two, who is actually 18 years old? And the answer to that is not in your will, you don't have to. If you want to have a guardian or a conservator appointed for somebody who's 18 years of older, 18 years of age or older, that's actually a formal process you're gonna to have to do with the court system in your state. So in your will, we don't need to set up that guardianship for an 18 year old who's perfectly fine, doesn't have any special needs and is getting ready to go off to college. But we do wanna make sure we have guardianship and trustee provisions for that child who's under the age of 18. Question number three this week, do I need a trust if it's my second marriage and we both have kids from a prior relationship? When we get to these kind of situations, we call them blended families. And it's very important that blended families create estate plans. For the reason is, if we're now married and we don't have an estate plan and one spouse dies, all of their assets, usually under law, when you die intestate without a will, those assets then go to the other spouse. And what that can do is create a problem where that other spouse, if they also die without a will, their direct descendants are their children. And you've now cut out the children of spouse number one who died because their children may not be able to inherit from spouse number two who dies. So, and we've had previous videos about this and there's lots of really good information on the web about why it's important to have an estate plan when you have a blended family. In this case, we're gonna use trusts for both parents because we wanna make sure that we're protecting the legacy between the two spouses, but also the legacy for those children from the prior relationships because the husband wants to make sure his prior children are inheriting what they're entitled to and the wife wants to make sure that her prior children are inheriting what they're entitled to. In this case, they're not gonna have any children in common. They're getting married later in life. There'll be no more children. So we wanna make sure we have a plan that takes into account the children from both of their relationships prior to the marriage. Question number four, what is a confession of judgment? So in this case, and this will also relate into question number five, the client is working out a settlement with somebody who owes them money. And their question was, how do we write this up? What's the best way to make sure I'm getting paid? And in this case, one of the provisions we discussed is the idea of a confession of judgment. 
so that the person who owes you money essentially signs a piece of paper that says, if I fail to pay you, you can then file this with the court, and it's called a confession, meaning I confess that I owe this person money, and they can enter a judgment so that they don't have to go through a whole summons and complaint and a whole lawsuit against that person when it's acknowledged that they owe them money. Now, if you've done any research online, you'll see that these are often used in the debt collection industry, where a lot of these debt collection companies would reach a settlement with somebody and also have them sign a confession of judgment. At least in New York, there was a problem with debt collectors running to court and filing those even where people weren't behind on their, on their payments. And that creates a problem because they don't actually, they shouldn't be filing that confession of judgment. So if you're looking into a confession of judgment for your debt, don't just try to do it on your own. This is a very intricate part of law that we want to make sure is done correctly and is registered correctly in the right places. Because if you're signing a confession of judgment, you don't necessarily want that just filed with court the next day because then they have a judgment against you that they can immediately try to enforce when you may be actually up to date and making payments on that debt. Question five this week, same, uh, same client. We're dealing with a contractor and we need to work out the negotiation of the money that's owed. And the question from the client is, should they hire a lawyer to negotiate with the contractor for this debt? Now, my advice to the client was actually, if you're having open discussions, which they were with the person who owes them money, work on those discussions first and see if you can come to an agreement on the general idea of how the repayment's gonna work. And then you can bring the lawyer in to negotiate the actual terms of the agreement, put the document together, make sure everyone signs off on it properly, and perhaps use a confession of judgment, as we talked about in the last question. Um, now, this client had spoken to another lawyer who said, sure, pay me $5,000 up front. I'll go in there. I'll negotiate everything for you. I'll be really aggressive and squeeze every drop and every dime I can get out of this guy which is another tactic and you can do. However, once you do that, the person who owes you money will likely then hire an attorney on their side, and then you're gonna pay for two attorneys to really fight over a lot of details. And while that's great for the attorneys and it helps us all make a, more money as we're attorneys, for you as the person who's owed money, you may wanna first look at whether or not you can work out this debt with the other person directly. I'm not saying you shouldn't hire an attorney, but I, what I am saying is consider the best way to get to that agreement first, because when you immediately hire professionals to come in and fight it out, maybe you end up in a lawsuit, the people who are going to win are going to be those lawyers who are fighting over maybe another five or $600, and that's going to be eaten up by your legal fees. So those are our five questions from the week. Said it's March 17th, it's St. Patrick's Day. Hopefully wherever you are, you're having a fun time and celebrating. There's a link in the description of this video if you'd like to ask questions in the future. If you found the video helpful, any of these questions are interesting to you, if you can hit the like button and you can hop over to YouTube and subscribe. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe while celebrating St. Patrick's Day. I will see you in two weeks.